about 85 employees in the affected area, people with homes destroyed, just out of their homes because they were so damaged. As the President has said, uh, that storm so devastated the fundamental infrastructure, I mean, the power infrastructure, street signs, ATMs, and you know, tornadoes do that over a swath that's maybe a mile wide. This was tens of miles wide. Uh, and so we actually, actually went down with bags of cash to provide a couple of cycles of payroll to commerce people because otherwise they were going to have no way to get a paycheck that could help them get started to restore their lives after that storm. And the tail of the storm, like all huge hurricanes, was a very, very, very long tail. I can remember being back a year later and the newspaper still had a centerfold that showed one year later which neighborhoods would have the trucks come through that Saturday for heavy debris removal a year after the storm went through. Uh, very sobering message, even just coming in six days after the storm and seeing what it had done to homes, to families, to communities. Andrew taught us, as all big events of that sort do, the value of resilience. And it teaches us, if we study the lessons closely, that yes, resilience has a sizable degree to do with the strength and capacity, the load-bearing capacity of our built infrastructure. But there are other critical dimensions of resilience too. Social resilience, communities, institutions, its financial resilience, its ability to move itself forward. All of those dimensions really are key to, to resilience. Tonight, we'll talk more particularly about the physical aspect of resilience, though, and about helping people be better prepared for it. Make better plans in the calm days before a storm or event hits, and be better able to respond as events do hit. Many storms since Andrew have repeated this message to us. We all know the names Katrina, Wilma, Isaac, Sandy, Irene, over and over again. The message is clear, we need to prepare. And we need to prepare not only for storms like that coming again, but for the kind of risk we are going to be exposed to in the decades and the centuries ahead. Just this week, we've seen two major reports come out reminding us that past is no longer prologue. What used to be a 100-year flood happens every several years. What used to be a major storm inundation event in Norfolk is now happening on every high tide. So the risk profile, the future risk that our communities face is bound to be quite different than the risks that we're preparing for now. And how to take that into account and build ahead for that is one of the key questions. I salute the congressman and work at FIU and the Build Strong Coalition are doing to bring that message home. Not build back, but build forward to the risk that's coming in the future. NOAA is sharply focused on resilience. I've laid out only four priorities for the agency during my tenure. A cornerstone and central one is resilience, and specifically to provide the information and services that can help communities become more resilient. Preparing and installing resilience in our communities makes fundamentally good economic sense. Every dollar spent, one dollar spent on preparedness or resilience alleviates four dollars of post-disaster rebuilding expense. It's the smart economic investment. But how we prepare, and how we think about the risks that are coming ahead, that part is a pretty rapidly developing story. Uh, and one that will show, in the long run, show whether we do or don't do a good job of harvesting the lessons learned and applying them to our future exposure. I just want to quickly highlight three facets of what NOAA is doing in this dimension, nationwide, coastwide, with a number of academic partners, but FIU has a central role in each of these three prongs. And I don't know, are you doing the slides? The next slide, thank you. So, three facets. The first one is wind. This is the typical plot you get. We now have advanced the science to where we can and will give five-day tropical outlooks as the science gets better, the horizon and the uncertainty keep improving. But these conventional plots you see, whether it's this one or the everyday warning con as a storm moves towards land, those have all to do about wind. What is the wind radius of the storm? What is the maximum wind speed of the storm? That's what hurricane means to most people. That's what hurricane means to most television broadcasters. 
That's what hurricane means to almost everyone who lives just a few miles in from the shore. But wind is certainly a critical hazard, as the videos we were watching before show us. And here's where the wall of wind comes in. It helps us, it points us in one direction where we need to pay close attention uh, to building in resilience in our, in our fixed infrastructure. We know now from research that NIST has done, that NOAA has done, uh, that the Build Strong Coalition and others have done, that academic partners like FIU have done, we now know how to build structures that can withstand an EF5 tornado or a Cat 5 hurricane. This FEMA National Science Foundation under the National Windstorm Reduction Program, these are the problems that really help us move forward. Our engagement at NOAA is to help us better understand and better be able to forecast those winds, their location, their speed, when they will intensify, so that we can give communities the time, once they're built, once they exist, to know when to take shelter and get out of harm's way. Severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and hurricanes all can expose communities to this kind of a severe wind damage. We're also upgrading our hurricane weather research and forecast model, the h wharf model. We've now got a 15 to 20 percent improvement in wind forecasts just since 2011. So better, more reliable information about what scale of hazard is coming this way. Our goal is to get even sharper on our track forecast, making another 20 percent progress on that. So shrink those cones by another 20 percent. You can count on it's going to be in that cone. Craig Fugate looks at those cones. Four days out, he wants 80 percent assurance that he's evacuating the right areas and not needlessly evacuating areas that won't be harmed and costing them the disruption and the business interruption. The biggest challenge, hardest yet to crack, has been intensity and rapid intensification of hurricanes. That's sort of the pacing item in the scientific work that we're doing at NOAA, again, with many academic partners in the atmospheric sciences. Second facet, the next slide, is storm surge. As you all know, being South Floridians, people don't die from wind in hurricanes. Wind scares the bejesus out of you, howls like crazy, you know, shoots debris through your window that explodes your home. But people don't die in hurricanes from wind. They die from water. They die from storm surge. In a hurricane, that's often the greatest single threat to life and a significant uh, source of damage to property as well. And we also know from experience that people die due to the surge even when they've had ample warning. So clearly one of the challenges in this domain for both our academic partners, our broadcast partners, and us to learn is what can we do better to communicate, to get the word out to people in a way that they tune in, they understand, and they act on warnings. How can we do that? That's beyond the scientific accuracy of the forecast. It gets to the social and behavioral sciences and the understanding of how people respond to, informa to information. At NOAA and the National Weather Service, our Weather Ready Nation initiative, that's what we're focused on. We no longer grade ourselves on the scientific accuracy of our forecast alone. We actually are holding ourselves accountable for whether people responded and lives were saved. We're putting ourselves in that equation all the way to the end point. And so to this end, we work with our social science partners to develop and inform maps like these, potential storm surge inundation map. Not long ago, we would send this out as this information as a text product. It looked like the world's worst long email you ever got. All bad font, tightly spaced, and geeky language. And we would tell you, you will have a surge of four feet above mean low water level. Good luck if you knew what the hell mean low water level was, or how that number would relate to where your home was, or if you're a Red Cross guy, the parking lot you thought you would stage your food and rescue supplies in, you know, what does that mean? This kind of format, this kind of tool, clear colors, ge geography I can recognize, places I can understand, uh, this is maybe uh, having quite a, a, a better effect. New York now has a massive campaign following Hurricane Sandy called Know Your Zone. Colors, labels on shop windows, walk through a neighborhood and see 
red, green, or blue with a number in it and just keep reinforcing. If you're here, you're in that zone, leave. If we say zone one is in trouble. So working with FIU, uh, this is a product we have uh, being issued, if we need to issue it, this season. It's still, we call it experimental, but it will be issued this season. And next season, our goal is to bring uh, into play a surge warning, just sort of like a tropical storm warning, because you may have the eye of the storm going somewhere over the northern part of the Tampa St. Pete area, here, but because of the topography, quite a surge a long distance away from the core of the wind field. So let's warn everyone along a coast that may see a focused surge. So transdisciplinary science is the key here, and contributions from people who understand the social sciences as well as the physical and the modeling and the, and the GIS information system work, and that's one of the places where FIU is making really notable contributions to the effort. Last, but very far from least, uh, we talk a lot about uh, hardened buildings and protective structures, uh, that, you know, gray infrastructure that we build or we armor our buildings or armor our shorelines. But Sandy in particular and recent advances in, in uh, natural science are helping us appreciate the importance of green infrastructure as well. Sandy provided a great example in Old Cape Bay, New Jersey, down on the South Shore. We saw clearly in that community that homes that had been built behind dunes fared better. Homes built the same way to the same standards as homes just down the shore behind an armored coast. The homes behind the dunes fared better than the ones down the shore. Nature has often, nature's equipped the planet with defenses, natural defenses along the coastlines. In many cases, we've taken them out and then we reinstall armored coastlines. In many cases, those are not as effective. The combinations for the future, you see a shot from Chicago on the left, and one of the artist concepts from the Rebuild by Design competition in New York. The notion that we're beginning to bring more into play it needs to really come to the foreground in this country, it's more in the foreground in some parts of Europe, is what's, what is the mixture of gray and green infrastructure? It gives us the best protection and the most cost-effective protection. It costs, in rough numbers, $20,000 a mile to armor a coast in an engineered fashion. It costs, in round numbers, $1,200 to restore natural def defenses like oyster beds along that same stretch. Oyster beds are natural reefs, wetlands, and dunes can take 90-some percent of the energy out of oncoming waves at a fraction of the cost. So, the energy of incoming waves, breaking those down, using dunes and oyster reefs and wetlands and seagrass beds and mangrove forests, using those natural defenses to do that in a smart combination with artificial defenses. You know, that's, that's really the cornerstone of our future. And I think it's exciting how uh, part of the exhibit that we'll look at tonight tells the story of how oyster reefs, in addition to protecting us, can help clean polluted waters, can help support aquaculture, can help provide nursery ground and shelter ground for young fish that will then go become the fish stocks that uh, supply our offshore communities. This is also the stuff of infrastructure systems rebuilding principles that NOAA developed jointly with the United States Army Corps of Engineers in the aftermath of Sandy. And these officially recognize now the protective values of natural infrastructure and are the first step towards bringing the right provisions ground rules, guidelines, and incentives to build in this new way back into play. So clearly restoring, restoring natural defenses, mixing green infrastructure into our equation. It's a win for coastal resilience. It's a win for water quality. It's a win for the ecological resilience of our coastal communities. So finally, this is how uh, I'd like to leave you thinking about NOAA in the final slide. We really are America's premier environmental intelligence agency. Massive, massive flows of observations, scads of data, super smart people that understand how the oceans and the atmosphere work. But most importantly, people who are passionately dedicated to the purpose of transforming that knowledge and those observations into actionable, action-oriented information that's pertinent to questions you're asking pertinent to design challenges your community is facing. 
When it comes to resilience, our focus is on ensuring we provide that environmental intelligence and that we ensure we have healthy waters, healthy habitats, healthy marine life, and healthy coastal communities. And those are the facets that we focus on and we'll focus on in the years ahead uh, as we pursue our goals of resilience at NOAA. Uh, we're delighted we can't do our mission without the academic partners of this country and the great institutions that we're fortunate to have. And when it comes to this thrust, and particularly hurricane and coastal resilience threats, the partnership we have with FIU is a sound and a good one that we look forward to growing and strengthening in the future. So thank you for the opportunity to share this with you tonight, and I look forward to our discussion. And to continue with the discussion, I'd like to bring up a Dr. Uh, Olson, who heads up FIU's Cross-Disciplinary Extreme Events Institute, which brings in collaborators from many colleges within FIU and our International Hurricane Research Institute, Dr. Olson. Following Dr. Sullivan is kind of like adding after Giancarlo Stanton. Let's see if I can get a couple of hits here. I was going to be a normal political scientist until December 1972, when I was put into the field in disaster research in Managua, Nicaragua. I was never the same again. We've all had those formative experiences. And then over the next, I keep saying 30, but it's actually 40 years, Guatemala, Mexico City, Chile, and I was recruited to FIU by Mark Rosenberg. Uh, and within seven months, we were in Hurricane Mitch in Honduras. So I was going to be normal, but I'm not normal anymore. <laughs> the global challenge we face is we have massive urbanization and coastal development, which is taking place in in, in the natural time, a very short period. But hazards work in long cycles. And they're patient. But I want to take you to urbanization. That was only 65 years ago. Next. That's 2000. Now I want to take you forward to 2050 by projection. We're doing it to ourselves. If we aren't resilient, we're going to pay some terrible prices. And that is a layering of the hazard events that we've had to deal with. Uh, go back a little bit because you don't want to be anywhere near the red things and you really don't want to be anywhere near the tsunami full of bars. After a while, they just sort of they layer into each other to the point where uh, I have not quite yet. I've been accused of raising property values in North and, and uh, South Dakota. But obviously they never spent a winter there. Okay, now. And there was just no place to put. This is only hurricane tracks, cyclone tracks, for 20 years. And when you look and you find Florida, we're covered by the tracks. This is just a 20-year band. And you all learned the category on the Safford Simpson scale doesn't necessarily mean anything. Sandy barely made it. But Sandy was a water event. So what is FIU doing? Well, there's three major things to talk about. Dr. Sullivan did a great job. The first is our coastal estuary storm tide. It's a storm surge model. We work very closely with, with the National Hurricane Center on that. The second one is the Florida Public Hurricane Insurance Loss Model. It's the only public model available. It's open, it's transparent. And then there's the wall of wind, which among other things, there's a model downstairs in this building. If you look at coastal vulnerabilities, the boxes show population concentrations in areas vulnerable to storm surge. 
We are the number one rank in the U.S. total insured property values and the number one ranked in coastal property exposed to storm surge. Folks, it's coming. Look again, Florida leads in using LIDAR data to get excellent, excellent mapping of storm surge areas. I know, you're looking for your house, it's there. <laughs> Some of the storm surge work we do with, with NOAA and the National Hurricane Center is really about fine-tuning evacuation. Because if you want to lose credibility with the public, tell them to evacuate, nothing happens. Because you got your maps a little wrong. Don't do that. The loss model, transparent, open, and Florida is the first state to combine wind, storm surge, and inland flooding. This cuts the water for the rest of the country. This looks like an academic slide, and it really is, except I would really like to have my losses on the red line with a mitigated structure as opposed to unmitigated because the difference at certain wind speeds, I'd rather have a 40% loss than a 60% loss. That may determine whether I rebuild or leave. And this is where rubber meets road. $300,000 masonry home in Miami 2012, unmitigated homeowner insurance, 11,000 and change, mitigated five and change, new built under the code, 4,600. This is what universities can do. This is what FIU is doing. This is, what, this is how we're trying to help. We have a patent pending for a bonding so that you don't have to drill or, or screw into wood, which weakens the wood. If this proves out, we'll be able to do retrofit at much lower costs and much more effectively. Next. Changing the building code and doing roof tile testing so that we have less damage. People tend to forget that it isn't just wind. Dr. Sullivan said, you hide from wind, you run from water. People tend to forget the amount of damage that water can do when it gets into the structure. It isn't just losing your roof. It's what the hell goes on inside afterwards. And sometimes even if you keep your roof, you get penetrated. And now there's going to be this is the wall of wind that's covered by the weather channel. An absolutely fantastic piece of work. We need to talk about hurricanes. Although a major hurricane hasn't hit the U.S. since 2005, many are still on edge this season as our homes are once again target. But one facility in Miami is working on a solution to protect homes by putting them right in the path of hurricane winds. Senior hurricane specialist Brian Norcross has more. Hurricane force winds. They can mercilessly exploit every weakness in a building, and most of those standing along the hurricane coast are not built to withstand a Category 3, 4, or 5 storm. But here in South Florida, people were trying to learn to do just that. And this super wind machine may be part of the solution. It's called the Wall Wind, a 12-fan research behemoth located on the campus of Florida International University in suburban Miami. You can get up to Category 5 wind speed, incorporate rainfall and water, and bring it into a wind field that's larger than many other research facilities of its kind. That's incredibly important because there's lots of work to be done and research to be done when it comes to wind interacting with structures. The wall is big enough and powerful enough that for the first time, full-size buildings, materials, and systems are being tested in real-world hurricane scenarios. The results have been eye-opening. We find out that some materials that we think are very vulnerable, um, they perform very well, and some of the failures 
we see are never tall. On this day, metal roofs came under the intense power of the wall of wind. Seeing actual Cat 5 winds billow up or lift the small part of the roof tells designers that they have built a strong system. What we're learning is that in a real wind event, that the building up of the panels is normal. The Miami-Dade County Building Code has led the way for decades in prescribing how to make buildings strong. And now people are coming from all over the world to use this monster machine to learn how to make their community strong as well. In Miami, at the Florida International University Wall of Wind, I'm Brian Norcross, The Weather Channel. Well, that was uh, very impressive, and uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Olson, for that presentation. Uh, we have another member of the South Florida delegation, a friend of FIU, and part of the part of his district, uh, FIU falls in, in part of his district. Uh, Congressman Joe Garcia, uh, Congressman Garcia, would you like to come up and say a few words? Uh, just uh, obviously, uh, President Rosenberg, you know, we're always uh, flattered to see you. It's good to see you here. We're obviously always excited to see FIU being on the leading edge and uh, uh, under uh, President Rosenberg's leadership, working with the Hurricane Center. We are uh, we are at the cutting edge of one of the key issues of our state, and so we're, we're very proud. Uh, it, it's my alma mater. I know that. Uh, this year, I'm supposed to get an honorary doctorate, so we can keep saying, so we can't say I'm not an alumni anymore. But, uh, but my, my father is an alumnus of the University of the University, so obviously it's great to be here, and uh, it's great to have FIU in DC, and always great to have FIU on the cutting and leading edge. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Congressman, for your continued support of FIU. And that doctorate, as soon as uh, you get some more funding for FIU, is <laughs> 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 Gracias, Joe. A lifelong friend, so uh, we're, we're very good friends. Uh, joining us now, uh, continuing with the program, uh, uh, are David Miller of the Flood Insurance and Mitigation Administration at FEMA uh, and Caitlin Lucina of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies and a leader of the Bill Strong Coalition. And they're both uh, coming up to provide their own perspective on how, how can policy and design yield safer, more disaster resilient communities. So David and Caitlin. standards and community resilience. 
resilience. Um, as studies have found that communities and homeowners respond better to incentive uh, incentives rather than um, punitive approaches. As we've grown in size and just presence in DC and nationally, we've expanded our platform from just the Safe Building Code Incentive Act, and we have a number of other bills that we are supporting um, as a national natural disaster mitigation package. Um, Congressman Diaz Bullard, who really has been a true leader on these issues, is also the sponsor of another one that he also mentioned, uh, the Community Savings and Resilient Construction Act, um, which incentivizes homeowners um, to rebuild with more resilient materials in the aftermath of a disaster. Um, we also support the research side of these things, and we're supporting Congressman Randy Nogbauer from Texas. He has a bill uh, to reauthorize the National Windstorm Impact Act, um, and it's additional funding for um, windstorm impact um, research. And as you know, as leaders of this, the science behind these things are really what drive the advocacy and uh, legislative campaigns. And finally, um, which is a bill that has just been introduced this Congress, the Disaster Savings Account, which was introduced in the Senate by um, Senators Inhofe and um, Mark Begich of Alaska. Those have you know, been huge champions of this, and Congressman Dennis Ross, also of Florida, which really has been a leading state um, in the fight for better, better building standards. And this bill allows homeowners to um, create a disaster-free, a tax-free disaster savings account um, where they can contribute up to $5,000 a year to pay for qualifying disaster mitigation expenses. So we do believe that there's a role for the federal government in a better national disaster mitigation plan and as leaders in our industry, in our coalition, and um, I, I represent the insurance industry, but also the coalition, um, we want to be active participants in planning and uh, educating members of Congress and communities on the importance of resilience and how small steps can really um, have big effects. Um, and so with that, I will uh, hand it over to you. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Rosenberg, thank you, Lynn. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, staff always prepares notes, and then they always wonder why I threw them away. I'm going to talk from a little different version, and, and, and maybe hopefully say some things that will invite further action. The partnership that we have with all of you, the university, with the weather service, with the coalitions for building safety, that broad array of partners is critically important. To but I want to say something because it's discussions that have come up recently. Uh, in FEMA, I'm responsible for two programs, the Mitigation Program and the National Flood Insurance Program. Any of you familiar with the National Flood Insurance Program? Yeah, my, my granddaughter calls me the, the forces of evil, and now you know why. There's a joke in there, so. But it does get to something in watching Dr. Sullivan's presentation and looking at this discussion of risk and risk management that I think is critically important. And as I continue to look at it, and we continue to look at it in FEMA, notwithstanding what we do with the flood insurance rate mapping, but per the piece of it, is that it's occurred to me that we don't have the right discussion, and we frequently understate our risk. We frequently understate the risk. We look at it in terms of the margin of who has to buy insurance and who doesn't, rather than a risk analysis of what's at risk, cost of that risk, the value of that risk, how we would invest in it, and how we walk through it in our communities. I had the privilege of talking to Dr. Olson before we were in today, and was congratulating the university on work that it's doing in the RISE program under the United Nations uh, uh, Office of Disaster Risk Reduction. Because they're one of eight partners that's talking about how do we communicate, how do we analyze, provide an analytic, how do we value risk, and then how do we build against it, how do we create partnerships, how do we talk about building and building facilities. It's a new conversation that we want to have about community investment. If I can understand the risk, if I can put it on this projection, can I understand the investments I need to make to mitigate that risk? Can I understand the role that insurance will play in covering the cost of that risk? 
and how those dynamics play off of each other. And it's a conversation we haven't had. We tend to have it in terms of loss reduction. That if your house is worth this and I reduce your loss, I have this. We don't talk about it in terms of community investment, how it attracts investment, how it affects capital markets, how it affects businesses overall. The research you're doing in those areas, what you bring to that table is critically important to what we do in FEMA and the conversations we're going to have and continue to have about mitigation and about insurance. And that includes what we're doing in building. So the last part of this little provocative discussion is one that we've had and how we encourage building code, building code implementation, code enforcement, and these are tough policy political decisions. One of them is simply when we go in and say to our federal partners, Dr. Sullivan's team, we've been part of a discussion that talks about a federal flood risk management standard. Simply stated, what standard are you going to build? Is a base flood elevation plus two feet, three feet, four feet? Remember, we understate the risk. And part of that is because we understand the politics of investment. How much of that risk are you trying to buy? When we had a discussion in New York, where we drew that line had to do with billions of dollars of investment. Uh, where we drew the line about the standard you would build into, whether it's above or below base flood elevation, and what code, what building, code, what standard you would build to, as heavy economic uh, uh, conditions associated. The research is key. I would challenge us to have a more open and frank discussion on risk and risk analysis, analysis and economic investment. It's going to be a painful discussion. If we don't address the slide that you showed us, so that growing impact development in high risk areas, what that represents in two true risk is critical. Thank you all very much for working with us. Uh, thank you, David and Caitlin. Uh, your, your participation in this is, is very important. Uh, so, folks, thank you so very much for being with us this evening. We hope you've learned some, uh, some and are walking away with some thoughts of what we can do to collaborate to make our communities more resilient. Uh, 